Hi, my name is Leilani. I am a former public and private school teacher for over 10 years where I taught middle school. And within those 10 years, I taught ELP and Title I mathematics to these wonderful middle schoolers. I am now currently a homeschool mom and I do evaluations for the state of Florida for homeschoolers. Now in this video, I'm going to talk about mathematics and middle schoolers. Specifically, I'm going to address the curriculum teaching textbooks and how it benefits the middle schooler you know it comes right alongside them when they're needing to learn more about you know math so I'm gonna break this down for you I am gonna go super duper in depth so first we're gonna talk about the academic side the curriculum side of things and why it is so well written and so well structured to really cater and come alongside those middle schoolers we're also gonna talk a little bit about how the middle school brain works and how teaching textbooks does come alongside them. I'm also gonna give you some examples. I'm gonna show you some screenshots to kind of help you understand why this is such a great curriculum. Next, I'm gonna talk about the layout of teaching textbooks and how it really strives to make your middle schooler such an independent worker. Also, how the grading its self grading, which uh, makes life easier for you as well as them. We're gonna talk about that a little bit. Now after you are done watching this video, you may want to check out one of my other videos. I have one on parenting the middle schooler and how to encourage you, the parent, to continue, you know, parenting the middle schooler. It's got some great information in there about the middle school brain, how it works. So when you're done with this video, go ahead and check that one out. I'll put it down in the description box below as well as the end of this video. But let's talk middle school math and teaching textbooks. Academics. The academics of teaching textbooks. Now, a lot of people don't talk about the academic side of teaching textbooks, and I think that's because us parents usually don't look at the academics because it's such an independent software that the kids can use without our help. But it's good stuff, okay? I'm gonna explain why. It's good stuff. Middle schoolers are in a period of their life where everything seems so inconsistent and out of whack and they need structure. In fact, they crave structure. It gives them safety, it gets them predictability, and it keeps them sane. It actually takes the pressure off of them when they're trying to figure out what's expected of them because when they're structured, they know what's expected of them. Like I said, keeps them sane. And you want a sane middle schooler, right? Now, as a result of, you know, this sanity and not having to have that pressure to think so much, you don't have to think so much about that. So it frees up their mind to think about the things that are important. They can use now their brain power to learn math. I know that's exactly what middle schoolers want to do with extra brain power, but we're talking math here. You see, in a structured learning environment, students are more likely to grow and thrive personal and academically. Because their brain is so focused on the academics, there's no wasted time in trying to figure out the structure. It's expected. Now, structure is also good for middle schoolers because during the middle school period of your life, your frontal lobe is developing this part right here. Now, this is the area of your brain that's going to be focused on future planning, making decisions, long-term goals, dreaming, those kind of things. Now, what better way to really help develop a healthy frontal lobe is by modeling and giving good examples of well thought out structure. Show them the structure so they can now plan with structure. Another need for structure lies in that phrase, if you don't use it, you're gonna lose it. And middle school is a prime example of when this phrase is most needed because they are going through a period of time where their brain is what they call pruning. And that basically means if you don't use it, you lose it. So, you know, it just gets shifted out, out of the brain. So finding a way to teach and maintain good habits with good structure is, is always good. So I keep talking about this structure thing, right? You're probably asking me why am I harping so much on structure? So I'm gonna show you and I'm gonna talk to you about why teaching textbooks really has good structure. Each lesson introduces a new mathematical concept. In the beginning, they're gonna type it out for you what the concept is and then give you an explanation of what it is with a walkthrough of a sample problem. Then they're gonna label the sample problems with letters like A, B, C, D, E. You're gonna do those and then we get into the approximately 25 problems listed afterwards. 
For each of these 25 problems, the student is going to get two opportunities to answer the problem correctly. If they get it wrong after two times and after using the optional hints, then teaching textbooks will guide them through how to do it correctly, but they will still mark it wrong. This is super important because the child can't cheat. Side note, there's a lot of software programs out there that allows for cheating. Teaching textbooks is safe because you can't, you can't cheat. If it's wrong, it's wrong, it's marked wrong, and it's put in the grade book as wrong. After a certain amount of these lessons, there will be a quiz, and it's expected. There's gonna be a quiz after you do a certain amount of these lessons. And that's it. Super structured, super relaxed, super predictable. It, it takes the edge off of, I have to do math again? You know, that kind of attitude that we hear like all the time. Maybe not all of you hear, I have to do math again, but it's a pretty common phrase with middle schoolers, but it takes the edge off of that because they know what to expect every single day and they know it's gonna happen. It's not a surprise. And yes, it's super nice like that. And students will actually say teaching textbooks is nice to them. They might actually say it's fun or better yet, easy. Now don't let that easy word scare you because it's not that it's easy, it's that the way it is structured, it's allowing for the student to learn in intervals. They're, they're gradually increasing their ability to do math problems and growing without realizing it. I'm, I'm gonna talk about that. But I do have to say, as a former middle school ELP Title I math teacher, one of the things I always hated is the fact that some days I would give the kids homework with 20 problems, other days they would get like 50 problems. So there's no, there was not much of, of consistency there. And it was, I hated that, I hated that. And teaching textbooks, as you can see, doesn't really do that. I also wanna note as a parent, if my child makes below a certain percentage, and they know this, I will go back over it and I will make them redo the problems that they messed up with me watching them to see if this is something that I need to work with them or re-explain to them with my words. Doesn't happen too often, but it has happened. But you know, that's a parent's discretion, so to speak. And you can totally do that. And that's what makes teaching sex so great is that there is some flexibility and the parent is still in charge of their child's academics. I mean, we have complete access to the grade book and we can, we can see everything whenever we want to. And it's password protected so the kid can't get into it. So now let's talk about the math of middle school, all right? Middle school math is super important because it's a stepping stone into higher level math. I mean, you've got the decimals and the fractions and the least common denominator and, and then you've got pre-algebra. It's pretty significant and honestly, it's quite intimidating to the middle school student because I mean, it's a big deal. They have to now take all the information that they've ever learned in math, combine it all together and just apply it to what they're doing. And that is kind of common with math because math in general is pretty sequential. There is a sequence and if a good foundation is laid, then they're not gonna have much of a problem. And that's something I have to give kudos to teaching textbooks is because they are very good at laying that strong foundation without wasting the student's time. That's why some kids will say it's easy. I believe one way that they have done this, I mean, obviously structure, but secondly, with its spiral method of teaching. So with teaching math, you usually see one of two methods in teaching. That's gonna be your mastery, where you take a concept, drill it in to the point where the child gets it, and once they get it, they move on to the next. So they may focus on decimals for a long period of time and then move on to fractions for a long period of time. Spiral is when you keep reviewing those things as you're learning new concept and building on top of it. Now, like I said, math is pretty sequential, so even if you're doing mastery, you get a little bit of that spiral because even though you're doing decimals, you're reviewing addition and multiplication, it's there a little bit, but not the way that teaching textbooks does it and in a way that I think personally is very effective for the middle school brain. You see the middle school brain is in the process of pruning and also those hormones are going a little bit crazy all over the place so they're a little bit forgetful and they're gonna need a little bit more review. I mean, we all need that review. All of us do, even elementary school kids and high school kids. Middle school kids a little bit more. 
Okay, I'm going to show you some examples to kind of help you understand what I'm talking about. Here is a seventh grade lesson on converting from mixed numbers to improper fraction. Okay, fun, right? Right? Super fun? No, it actually is kind of fun. No, it really is. I'm not just saying that because I really actually do think it's fun. I was trying to be funny saying fun right. And I really actually meant it. <laughs> Remember that the first thing that they teach is the new concept in the lesson. But let's see some practical spiraling. Here is problem three. This is a division, a long division problem, and it's not fractions. They did not learn about division here, but in fact, they learned long division in lesson 17. However, since lesson 17, teaching textbooks has been reviewing this concept, paying special attention to stretching their ability to more difficult division problems, but not overwhelming them at the same time. It's like a slow stretch. You know like when you get braces and they put them on your teeth and it hurts a little bit, but over a period of time they start to tighten them and tighten them and eventually get your teeth lined up. It doesn't hurt as much as if they were just going to yank your teeth in place. It's that, it's kind of that kind of idea. When you do it slow like this, it gives the brain time to retain the rules, but not letting it go too far where they forget the new concept. This way, the ability to do long division moves from their short-term memory to their long-term memory. Students don't really notice that they're being challenged, and therefore, that's when the whole, like, it's easy thing comes out. It's a gentle but effective technique. Now, let's look at problem five. Finding the greatest common factor. Same idea. They did not learn about greatest common factors in this lesson. It's from a previous lesson. Problem eight, adding fractions with unlike denominators. Now here's problem 12, which is converting mixed numbers into an improper fraction. This is a part of a lesson. So you see how they're spiraling things in, right? That's what spiral learning is. This is the whole thing. If you don't use it, you lose it. And spiral really kind of cuts that out. Now we're going to look at the real world word problems and they always have word problems at the end of the lesson for the kids to review and do. Here's an example. At Fairfield Mansion, the ratio of window washers to floor scrubbers is three to four. If there are 39 window washers, how many scrubbers are they? Now, if they're going to go into the floor scrubbing window washing business, this, this is going to come in handy. Well, actually, this will help out in any business situation. I mean, just thinking out loud here, maybe you might need to know the ratio to see if you need to hire or fire people. Maybe you'll put time, look at time, how long it takes for one group of people to do the other. I just, like I said, think it out loud here. This is real world type situations. And here's another one. In the new settlement, the ratio of nurses to doctor is seven to two. If there's 28 doctors, how many nurses are there? Obviously today in, in our society, the medical field is very important and knowing, you know, if you have enough nurses on staff, doctors on staff, the ratio, this stuff is, is really important, okay? Now I know for a middle schooler, they might not care about this stuff. But let's talk about that frontal lobe again. That frontal lobe is planning their future and thinking about what they wanna do when they grow up. They're thinking, they're processing through what they see. Being exposed to some of these new ideas, such as you know floor scrubbers, window washers, the medical field, problems that they have to come across, they're starting to think maybe that might be interesting to them. They won't say that out loud. I mean, God forbid a middle schooler tell you that a word problem inspired them to go and become a medical practitioner. However, it it could put a little seed nugget in their brains and they won't say a thing. But it, it could, it could very well. It actually exposes them to different career fields, different situations, different problems. So they have more things to think about, more opportunities to choose and they see what they like. They see what's interesting to them. That is what I'm talking about when I say real world problems. Now, a lot of this of what I said, I really, really believe is what makes teaching textbooks great for the middle school student. I've done many, many evaluations for homeschoolers. I've tested them. And one thing I've noticed, there is a pattern. And the pattern is that jump in score, the no holes as they're moving up in levels, like they're not missing a bunch of problems in between. That's what I mean by holes. That tends to be a student of teaching textbooks. My son 
jumped grade levels when he switched over to teaching textbooks. And that's because they really paid attention to building a strong structure. They really paid attention to building in that spiral method. They really paid attention to growing their ability to do math problems, more difficult math problems. And there's not a lot of wasted time. It's straight to the point, get it done so you can move on and be a homeschooler and do the things that you enjoy. But now that I've talked about all of the academics and structure, I do want to talk about the layout of teaching textbooks, the visual presentation of teaching textbooks and the practical side of things, so to speak, that us parents love so, so very much. Let's talk about these wallpapers and the buddies and the stickers. You know, what's a fun program without some of these? However, teaching textbooks does not overwhelm that middle school mind because that middle school mind is so, so very super distracted at this age. And with too much stuff, it's it's distracting. I've There is a program, a software program, Remain Nameless, that my son will actually spend hours on just picking out the different characters and buddies and backgrounds just because there's just so much there. There's too much there, but teaching textbooks does not overwhelm any of the students with this stuff. In fact, my kid has only had really two, two buddies this whole entire time he's been using it. And the buddies are pretty age appropriate too. If you look at them, you're not gonna see like cute little, no, for middle school, it's age appropriate. I mean, they got this like, I think it's like a graham cracker with like a marshmallow on top of it. They have like faces and stuff and, I mean, it looks pretty cool. I don't know what it is. It's cool though. <laughs> I think it's a graham cracker with a marshmallow. That's the only thing I can think of. Also at the middle school level, as parents want to see our kids to start develop independence in learning. We always talk about that love for learning or that, it, you know, teach a kid how to fish, not give them a fish kind of mentality. Well, teaching textbooks really, really does this. It is because, obviously, it's on the computer and it's hands-off. You can trust teaching textbooks to actually teach your kid because of the structure that I just talked about. It's going to teach your kids how to take that learning into their own hands. Another thing that's great for middle schoolers, this is just me personally, maybe, please comment if you can relate, but sometimes if they hear me teaching over and over again, they start to, you know, zone me out. But if I say something, and they hear that another person say the same exact thing, they may say I'm an idiot, but they say this person's brilliant. I have that problem, but I think it might just, it might just be me, right? <laughs> the cool thing about teaching textbooks is they actually have a human voice teaching, not a robot, but a human voice teaching the lessons. And I think he has such a unique voice. It's a perk. In fact, my kids, if they hear somebody that sounds like him, they're like, you really sound like the guy on teaching textbooks. Are you? Yep, that's happened. And one of everybody's favorite things about teaching textbooks is that it is self-grading. Self-grading in a way that you, the parent, don't have to grade it. That saves you so much time. But also, when the student gets the problem wrong, it immediately shows them how to fix the problem and do the problem correctly, so to speak. Look, this is pretty obvious, but I must say this phrase, study shows that if you show the correction to a problem immediately after they get it wrong, they're more likely not to make that mistake again, as opposed to waiting a week after they did the problem when they're probably not even gonna look at it, or maybe in class the next day, it's not gonna be fresh in their mind, so to speak. So that's really cool about TT. I call it TT, teaching, teaching textbooks. We call it TT in our house. But what I really love about teaching textbooks is that there's freedom, there's trust, there's ownership within that structure. And sometimes with structure brings about the most wonderful freedoms. So this way the student is free to grow and learn at their own pace. And when they do well, like, you know, they get like a hundred and get no problems wrong, they themselves know that it was them that did it, not you. Not you, the parent that helped them. Now, what I've done for you is in the description box below, I have left you a link to try a free trial and also purchase the 12 month access to their course. Now, this is a paid promotional video, but I will say this, I personally am very, very, very picky with who I partner with. 
And I would have never done this video if I didn't really believe in teaching textbooks and what they're doing. They are a strong company, they've been around for a long time, and they know what they're doing. I believe that they are doing an amazing work within the homeschool community. So make sure to check out that link if this is right for you. And of course, if you have any questions about any of this, you are free to ask me from someone who loves math. I love math. And teaching textbooks also has amazing people working there so you can always call them up and ask them questions if I was not able to answer them. Also make sure to check out some other stuff on my channel. Consider subscribing. We talk about homeschooling, we talk about middle school, and we talk about parenting kids with special needs. Thank you guys for watching and I will see you in our next video. Bye!